Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to, I think we're going to start. Um, uh, as ever with COP, things are pretty fluid, but I'm worried about that clock back there, which when it gets to zero, we get evicted. So we're going to start. Um, so on, on behalf of the UK um, uh, and, the, and the COP26 presidency, huge welcome to Glasgow. Uh, a lot has happened already today, and a lot happened yesterday, but a key part of today's summit has been a commitment by the multilateral development banks to reconcile their portfolios not only with the Paris goals, which most had already committed to, but with nature as well. And I want to thank, in his absence, he'll be here in a second, uh, Maurizio Clava Caroni, uh, president of the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, who launched the statement uh, on nature, people, and planet this morning with a very powerful speech at the main plenary. So before we hear from, from the banks themselves, I just want to say a few words about why this is so significant. Um, and it may not be the sexiest part of our, our, our package of commitments that we secured today, but it is arguably, well, certainly right up there in terms of being among the most important. I'm not going to dwell on this, but people here will be aware. We're at COP. You are aware that we are in crisis circumstances. We know that the rate of deforestation that we're seeing, 30 football pitches every single minute, simply cannot be sustained. It is madness. We know that the impacts of our activities on the ocean, denuding them just as quickly as we're filling them up with trash. We know that around a million species face extinction. And I could spend the next 39 minutes talking about how dire things are for the natural world. I won't. You'll be pleased to hear. But as we destroy those complex ecological systems, we also destroy the free services, or undermine at least the free services that nature provides, on which each and every one of us depends, but particularly the world's poorest communities, who depend much more directly on those free services than wealthier communities. We also know that there is no pathway to net zero. There's no pathway to staying within one and a half degrees that does not involve massive increased efforts to protect and restore the natural world. We believe that nature-based solutions like forests and mangroves and so on could provide around a third of the most effective and cost-effective solutions to climate change. But the beauty of backing nature as part of a solution to climate change, in addition to the fact that it's just so effective, is that you're ending up, you deliver so many solutions to so many other challenges that we face as well. Poverty, uh, pollution, uh, even, as we all now know, pandemics. So as presidents of COP, we took a decision right at the beginning that we were going to put nature at its heart, at the heart of our response to climate change domestically, but also at the heart of what we are trying to secure from world leaders, from businesses, and so on. And I think the package of commitments that we delivered today do genuinely represent the turning point that our forests crucially and have long needed. We have uh, 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 well over 100, I think it's now 114 countries committing to end deforestation by 2030. The countries that signed represent uh, nearly 90% of the world's forest. We have unprecedented finance commitment, $12 billion, to be invested in protecting and restoring forests from 12 donor countries. Uh, we, of course, the, the, the UK is a contributor to that, having secured the commitment. We're committing at least three billion of our international climate finance to nature-based solutions, and at least half of that on forests. Uh, we've secured a package today for, of support for indigenous people, and that's not just a box-ticking exercise uh, to be inclusive. It's much, much more than that, that we know that indigenous communities have been on the front line for, for pretty much forever, and often against the odds, often in the face of really acute danger, they have protected vast amounts of land around the world, critically important ecosystems around the world. So in addition to the arguments of justice, which you will know well, it's actually a pretty cost-effective way to save a lot of land is backing the people who are doing a good job protecting that land. So today's $2 billion commitment, or just under $2 billion commitment to indigenous people, is a step change. It's a different cosmos to where to the kind of support that existed before. Uh, we've had a commitment from the big financial institutions, um, between them presiding over assets worth almost nine billion, nine trillion, sorry, nine trillion dollars, who have committed to uh, 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 removing deforestation from their portfolios, their investments in, 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 appropriate, in the supply chains as well. And we've had a commitment from the biggest buyers of commodities that they're going to stop buying commodities that are grown at the expense 
of forests. And that the, the, the message that that sends around the world is very hard to exaggerate. It's hugely, hugely important. And, and as one of the, the biggest contributors to the multilateral system through the multilateral development banks, uh, we have been working very closely with our friends on this uh, panel here to secure the commitment that you're about to hear a bit more about from these fantastic leaders uh, on the panel. And, and it just seemed to us and seems to us to be absolutely right that when it comes to the use of public money, that money should be used for the public good. It should not be used in such a way that it degrades the public good. So I can't exaggerate how happy I am with the commitment that you have made. I think it has the capacity, this commitment, perhaps not to flip the market, but certainly to shift the market very significantly in the right direction. And before we see uh, some footage of, of some of the brilliant projects uh, that have been supported, I, it, it's my, my huge pleasure to invite each president we have here, and a few that are not here, uh, to tell us how your institution is integrating climate and nature, and how you anticipate achieving the goals of the statement that you signed up to. And I think before we come to our live panel, we're going to see a video where we will hear briefly from uh, Werner Hoyer, president of the European Investment Bank, Dr. Mohammed Suleiman al Jasser, president of the Islamic Development Bank, um, who I may be here with us, but he's certainly on the video, uh, and David Malpass, the president of the World Bank Group. So we're going to see that video, and then I'm going to come to our real people here on the stage. Dear COP26 participants, Assalamu alaikum. It has been my pleasure to sign the joint statement on nature and people this morning on behalf of the Islamic Development Bank, along with my peers, MDB's heads. The Islamic Development Bank has long invested in nature as part of its development sector operation solutions. In 2019, the Islamic Development Bank developed its sustainable finance framework under which it has been able to issue green sukuk or Islamic bonds. The proceeds from its debut 1 billion euro green sukuk have been used to finance projects whose objectives include the sustainable management of natural living resources and land use. Furthermore, the Islamic Development Bank has developed its environmental and social safeguards policy and has already mainstreamed nature-based solutions into its urban, water, agriculture, and climate change policies and operational strategies towards 2025. 2025 is the target date for climate finance to account for at least 35% of our funded operations. Financing green projects with robust nature-based components will help the bank achieve its ambitious objectives. This target will complement efforts made in countries like Sierra Leone, where the Islamic Development Bank supports the Guma Valley Water Company in addressing the water provision needs of 1.6 million people in the city of Freetown. This is done in part through the conservation and rehabilitation of the watershed, including Western Area Peninsula protected forests, creating green jobs for the youth at the same time. The Islamic Development Bank has supported building the resilience to recurring food insecurity of 2.6 million people in Chad by promoting water harvesting through soil and water conservation schemes. In Indonesia, the bank supports 30,000 rural households in increasing their income and food security, including through sustainable land management and agricultural practices. By collectively committing to integrate nature in our operations, I believe the Islamic Development Bank will deliver on that promise along with, with peer MDBs as part of its mandate of empowering people for a sustainable future. Thank you very much. Protecting nature is an underlying principle of our sustainable financing. For this reason, we at EIB, the EU Bank, are wholeheartedly signing up to this joint MDB statement on nature 
people and planet. It reinforces our commitments on nature and biodiversity, which run through all of our work. We have pledged to support 1 trillion euros of climate action and environmental sustainability investments in the decade to 2030. This means working with more public and private partners, as well as other financial institutions. It means mobilizing finance for sectors like sustainable agriculture, sustainable forestry, and the ocean economy globally, but especially where some of the largest biodiversity losses are occurring in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Nature, people, and the planet are the common thread woven together in the Sustainable Development Goals. With this in mind, the U-Bank has contributed up to 1 billion euros to the Great Green Wall Initiative in the Sahel region. The IB will help strengthen Africa's vast natural capital, its unique biodiversity and ecosystems to bring opportunities in social and economic development, while contributing to ecosystem restoration and resilience and climate action. We also know oceans play a vital role in the world economy and they are largest carbon sink on the planet, helping to regulate the global climate. However, oceans under are under enormous pressure with economic and social implications for billions of people. This is one key area where the climate and nature agendas need to converge. In 2018, the EIB joined forces with KFW and IFD to launch the Clean Ocean Initiative. By 2023, the initiative will have financed more than 2 billion euros for the management of waste, wastewater and stormwater in Africa, Asia and Latin America. We have already achieved two thirds of this goal. At the U-Bank, we recognize that the economic consequences of biodiversity loss represent a systemic risk for our partners. As of next year, we will develop a diversity risk score to assess the biodiversity risk of our counterparts. As the EU Climate Bank, we have been committed to tackling and addressing the effects of climate change for a very long time. We strongly believe that the conservation of biodiversity and the protection of nature requires an equally strong commitment. Let's take action together. Fellow colleagues from NDBs, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I've just come from the G20 Leaders Summit in Rome where we discussed the importance of nature-based solutions as an important tool for climate action. Biodiversity is a vital global public good. It's also a vital development necessity. Nature loss often impacts the poorest countries the most. Our research estimates that low-income countries could lose around 10% of their GDP annually by 2030 if select ecosystems such as forests, fisheries, and pollinators collapse. More than half of global GDP is generated in industries dependent on ecosystems. This is even more true for countries that make up the Amazon basin. Biodiversity and climate change are closely interlinked with terrestrial and marine ecosystems serving as critically important carbon sinks. At the same time, climate change is a direct cause for the loss of biodiversity and ecosystems. This is why nature-based solutions are an integral part of our climate change action plan. The World Bank Group has financed biodiversity conservation around the world for over three decades. In the Solomon Islands, the World Bank and MIGA are supporting the development of a biodiversity action plan as part of the Tina River Hydropower Project. In China, the World Bank Group supports forestry, landscape, and river basin management programs and marine plastic abatement. In Turkey, we support resilient landscapes that enhance livelihoods for forest communities through erosion control, forest rehabilitation, and income generation. In Indonesia, we're supporting the government's mangrove conservation and restoration efforts, which benefit coastal resilience and enable carbon sequestration. Many of our investments in nature are focused on the poorest countries. Their investment needs are growing. That's why we're discussing with shareholders under the IDA 20 replenishment, a step up in support for nature-based solutions. We believe that the private sector has an important role to play in supporting biodiversity. 
IFC recently committed its first $300 million blue loan in Indonesia for recycling 50 billion PET bottles a year by 2025 to help address the problem of plastic pollution. We've mainstreamed environmental sustainability into the investment projects we finance all over the world. The principles embedded in our environmental and social framework and performance standards have been adopted globally by banks, companies, and policymakers. These frameworks recognize that protecting uh, and conserving biodiversity and sustainably managing natural resources are fundamental to sustainable development and to the lives and livelihoods of communities, including indigenous people. This COP presents an opportunity to discuss meaningful action on nature-based solutions. Next May's COP15 will be another milestone. The, COP, the COVID pandemic, biodiversity loss, climate change are all reminders of how connected we are. Together with other MDBs, we look forward to working with countries on updating their national biodiversity plans and enhancing our work on biodiversity and nature. Thank you all. Three um, very powerful uh, speeches from three extremely important uh, figureheads. So in, in the interest of time, I'm going to just quickly tell you who we have here, for those who don't already know, and then I'm going to ask our speakers to just speak one after the other. Um, and we're going to start with Maurizio Clever Caroni, the president of the uh, Inter-American Development Bank. And I do want to just particularly thank him for the leadership he's shown in helping us get to this point. He's been truly heroic. <laughs> Absolutely right. And, um, and those of you who heard him speak earlier today will, will recognize the uh, authenticity of his, uh, the position he's taken and the passion with which he's pursued this cause. Uh, we're also going to hear from uh, Dr. Hygienus uh, Leon. Uh, the President of the Caribbean Development Bank. Thank you so much for being here. From Odile Renault uh, Basso, the President of the European Bank for uh, Reconstruction and Development. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and Masatsugo Asakawa, the President of the Asian Development Bank. Thank you very much indeed for being here. Um, and then finally, Sir Danny Alexander, a former colleague of mine. It's lovely to have, a, have you as a colleague again, uh, the Vice President of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So, Maurizio, we're going to start with you. And thank you again. Thank you, Lord Goldsmith. It's really a pleasure to be here. And since you talked about authenticity, I have to throw away my, my remarks. And, and I'm going to be really brief because I had the, the, the privilege uh, to speak on, on, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, the other MDBs, in regards to the statement that we uh, presented today. And it was uh, truly a privilege to do so. Uh, but I want to just highlight a few key points here. And I, and, and I apologize for being late. I came, I was tardy because I was signing with President Duque of Colombia. It really a historic uh, PBL, a, a policy-based loan, uh, with the government of Colombia, historic in the sense of the magnitude uh, we yesterday uh, signed the long-term strategy for Colombia, one of the first and most innovative in Latin America and the Caribbean, of which the IDB took uh, a great deal of pride to be working with Colombia on, along uh, with France, that also uh, uh, participated in that regards. And then today we were able to sign this PBL to help with the implementation uh, of that, an implementation of a uh, sustainability program, resilience program uh, for Colombia, including uh, for the Amazon basin uh, in Colombia. And it was historic in the sense of not only the $600 million, which the IDB is proud uh, to put towards this program, but one of the largest mobilizations that we have seen, at least in our bank's history in that regards, uh, with five partner countries, France, Germany, the UK, Sweden, and Korea, uh, of which we were able to mobilize another $600 million for a $1.2 billion uh, uh, operation in that regards to support uh, Columbia's implementation. So it goes to the point, we're not just talking the talk, we took action right away and we're taking further action. A couple of things I just want to highlight, uh, uh, just in, and I, I, I talked about some of them and including to, and we're very proud obviously what we've done in regards to Paris alignment starting now in 2023, upping our green and climate finance uh, over uh, from literally $5 billion to almost $25 billion by 2025, which is, which is literally a 50% increase uh, than in the previous four years. Uh, and the ambition, and we talked about, and I heard some of the speakers talk about the private sector. You know, for us, for me, one of my priorities is that the IDB uh, to be innovative and market-oriented. Because at the end of the day, all of us here can get together and can mobilize all we want, and we're not going to solve the problem. No government, no international financial institution is going to solve the problem. We need the private sector to mobilize. And there's $53 trillion 
in ESG capital sitting there looking for good investments. And the way I see it and the way we're working at the IDB is that if we can catalyze just 10% of that for Latin America and the Caribbean, that's Japan's GDP. That would be transformational in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we're looking to create mechanisms, vehicles that will help catalyze that private capital that's looking to invest in good, renewable, climate-friendly projects in Latin America and the Caribbean. And for that, we're doing innovative stuff with our thematic bonds, of which the IDB has uh, been part of 60% of those issuances, the Green Bond Transparency Index, of which we're the first to launch in the world to help investors be able to follow green projects from beginning to end so they know where their money is going and they know the results uh, of, of their investments in that regards. And we're extraordinarily proud to have uh, launched at the New York Stock Exchange a couple of weeks ago a whole new asset class called natural asset companies, which is going to be able to reward, incentivize companies uh, for conservation, biodiversity. Uh, and we can really, really break the financial paradigm here of how we can fundraise, of how we can uh, mobilize financing uh, for green projects. So we're really excited about how we can innovate. And I look forward to always working uh, with our colleagues uh, across the globe uh, in, in that sense of how, you know, I think we're, it's also a good challenge. I learn a lot from them. And we can challenge each other of how to continue uh, moving the needle uh, forward in that regard. So again, thank you for your leadership, Gosmosme, and appreciate uh, the effort. Oh, one more thing I had to mention. I'm sorry. Amazon initiative. Look, I think there is probably no more particularly important initiative in the world today on climate than the Amazon initiative. It is the lungs of the world. We all know this. When the Leticia P P Pact came, thanks to the leadership of President Duque and the eight presidents of Latin America and the, Carib of, of the Amazon Basin, a lot of criticism was like, okay, well, this is a great political initiative. You all have burden sharing, but what are you going to do about it? We came in a year ago and said, we're going to create an Amazon fund and we're going to start implementing projects. A year later, not only have we done so and we created an Amazon unit now at the IDB, but we have already had the Green Climate Fund has already uh, put uh, uh, nearly $600 million uh, in this sense, and we're announcing uh, in the next uh, two days uh, Germany and the Netherlands have also joined uh, the Amazon uh, initiative and fund of the IDB in this effort. We would love to have, obviously, the UK participate. We're going to go to be Spain next week to also do so, and I think we have right there. That's the, I'm going to talk to you right after. I'm going to come. I'm going to come. Uh, see, he just sold you out. Hey, but no, I think this is a really unique opportunity because this is, this is the thing about the, the Leticia Pact, which you saw for yourself when you were down there. It's not about picking, like, one country, you know, France versus Brazil, U.S. versus Bolivia. No, 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 no. There's no politics involved. It's the eight countries of the basin working to find solutions amongst themselves. And the approach we've taken, and today we had a lot of the indigenous leaders from the Amazon communities, is a micro to macro. It's not like in the past, the old IDB that goes in and says, hey, let's create this big hydro plant, et cetera, and this is going to be good for you, and, and take it. No, no, no. How do we work to develop those communities and then expand from therein with their buy-in from day one in confidence building? So I'm going to come talk to you after. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mauricio. Um, I want to start with uh, one particular data. And that is that the countries in the region, I represent the Caribbean Development Banks, uh, 19 borrowing member countries. They are among the most vulnerable states in the world. And in particular, with regard to climate finance. And to put this in perspective, we have had over the last decade about 190 natural hazard events. And those have almost a disastrous effect on economies for one key reason. Not only do they repeat, but the duration it takes to recover from those require astronomical amounts of finance to rebuild. So that's, I think, the first point we want to make. And because of that, and because of our responsibility to our countries, we have made it part of our overall strategy to effectively make nature-based solutions an integral part of how we approach the entire economic development of our states. And in particular, we've looked at three key areas. The first is the carbon sequestration element. The second is increasing or even rebuilding our resource base to facilitate um, enhancements in livelihoods of the peoples of the countries. And the third is to promote climate resilience. So I think with that in mind, which is clearly quite broad, we've had to think of prioritizing how we are actually going to do this. 
and we could think in terms of four or so key elements. One, the, the watersheds and land management area is key. Uh, you move towards the coast, coastal restoration is equally important, and with that fisheries to enhance livelihoods of the, of the people. The third, of course, is the marine uh, resources that we have. How do you not only um, sustain this, but build it to be able to use with regard to uh, blue economy type activities? Uh, the fourth that goes with this is the integration of the entire marine terrestrial ecosystems with national development plans so that it becomes an integrated element of how we actually approach uh, the whole issue of development. Uh, within that, I can point to a couple of key examples in those areas that we've pursued. In uh, St. Lucia, that happens to be my uh, home country, we've actually done an afforestation and reforestation project that uh, looks at improving the recharge rates of groundwater, uh, reducing soil erosion as a means of capturing that element of the land management system. We have a coral reef project that equally looks at restoring that resource base on coral reefs uh, with a nice twist in that it captured both public, private, and community-based institutions, not the typical way we do this. And in Haiti, we actually have had a, a project that looks at marine um, coastal restoration to, again, facilitate the strengthening of fisheries and livelihoods of people who live along the coast. And so the, the real question is, how do we actually go about doing this? What we think is you have to have targets and you have to be catalytic. Uh, as I said, the numbers are very large. We don't see ourselves as being able to do this on our own. But we have pledged 30% of our own resources towards climate-related uh, projects. And we are look, hoping that this would be catalytic and could invite partnering and partnerships to allow us to be able to do more for those countries that I've said are extremely vulnerable. And so I think the areas where we can surely uh, look to do this is one, going forward in terms of capacity development, um, such that they can implement those in a way that we can see tangible benefits. The, the second would have to be in terms of knowledge management, um, data on climate-related aspects, analysis, discovery, of things that can actually work and presumably designing strategies that can make this uh, come alive. And the third is, I think, helping governments design enviable and enabling environments that could allow the private sector to participate more. And so when Mauricio talks about bringing in the private sector, we see this as, as critical. And so this morning, we actually brought in the idea of this multi financing uh, facility that would bring together different institutions to help bridge the enormous gap that we are talking about financing for development. Thank you. Thank so you. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and to have signed uh, this statement because I really believe that uh, nature and biodiversity are at the core if very essential for our life. We depend on them for what we eat, from what we breathe, from our capacity to live on the planet. And we need also nature for to help us dealing with climate change because of the absorption capacity of um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So... Um, Despite all that, we know also that our activity, um, economic activity, cause biodiversity loss at a rate which is without precedent. And this is still the situation we are facing. There is a contradiction between public goods and uh, private interest in uh, the use of our natural capital. And that triggers two very important tragedies. We all know tragedy of commons, where we see uh, environment, public environmental assets being systematically degraded, and tragedy of the horizon, where our generation and past generation deplete natural resources at the expense of the next future generation. So given that I be strongly believe that to achieve our sustainable development goals, we really have to transform the way we use and we val value nature. And we have to consider nature as a real asset and not only something we can co consume and rely on. 
So we are at the EBRD working with our colleagues, MDB and bilateral development agencies to mainstream natural, posit natural positive solution in what we do. It's beyond climate financing and I think it's an another dimension. Uh, in the last 30 years, we have invested more than 6 billion euros in projects in the field of pollution prevention and what wastewater treatment and more than half of this amount has been spent in the last four years. So we see an acceleration in, on, on our activity in this area on a voluntary, I mean, it's the outcome of voluntary strategy. We have gained, for example, very valuable experience in promoting systematic environmental remediation, and we look, we look at every project with a very strong glance, I mean, look at the impact on sustainability, biodiversity, and so forth. For example, thanks to the Northern Dimension Environmental Partnership, um, this has been particularly true of the Baltics and um, Barentsea. This could be a useful model to, do, to deal with pollution in the sea, in Mediterranean, Mediterranean and Red Seas as well. I think that to get today, with the statement we have been all committing to, our approach is brought to a new level. We commit to increase and coordinate our policy work to achieve systematic impact. And to conclude, I would like to quote uh, some words said by uh, Dr. Jane Goodell during our last annual meeting uh, this summer. Our planet is facing multiple interrelated crises, climate change, the COVID pandemic, and the loss of biodiversity. It's now time to find new ways of doing things and protect the beautiful tapestry of living things on which we depend. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Uh, we are also very delighted uh, to join forces with you today uh, to signal out uh, combined intent to address environmental degradation as a key component of addressing climate change and ensuring long-term prosperity. Well, nature positive investment, of course, uh, will, be, will be the key in contributing uh, to ADB's recently uh, announced uh, ambition to provide the US uh, $100 billion uh, in cumulative uh, climate financing from 2019 to 2030. Uh, including uh, 34 billion US dollars uh, dedicated to climate adaptation and resilience. Uh, let me uh, briefly uh, highlight uh, three of our main initiatives to uh, further uh, mainstream uh, nature into our operation. Uh, first, uh, to protect the oceans, uh, coastal uh, megacities, and island uh, nations in our uh, region that are on, on the front lines of climate change, ADB launched uh, so-called action plan for healthy oceans and sustainable blue economies in uh, 2019. Uh, we aim to catalyze five billion US dollars in investment and technical assistance by 2024, uh, which includes a focus on nature-based and circular economy solutions. And these will help to a uh, couple of things, strengthen uh, coastal community and ecosystem resilience, and also address uh, marine plastic pollution and promote blue economies. And we are using uh, innovative finance, uh, attract private investment, uh, like uh, others also mentioned. Uh, we have issued 9.6 billion US dollars in green bond since 2010. And more recently, uh, this year actually, our first ever uh, dual tranche blue bonds uh, was around 300 million US dollars. Second, uh, we are working uh, to uh, restore uh, wetland ecosystems through a uh, regional approach. Uh, we are also uh, building on the success of the Jiangsu Yanchen uh, Wetland Protection uh, Project, which contributed uh, to the successful uh, listing of the wetland area in China as a UNESCO World Heritage Nature Site. Uh, the partnership initiative, so-called Regional Flyway Initiative, is looking to mobilize up to $3 billion in project investment in the region over the next 10 years. And finally, third, uh, we are supporting efforts to value, uh, and, uh, value nature better. Uh, we are establishing a digital platform 
uh, to integrate uh, nature positive solutions in a, a project design through a, a so called natural uh, uh, capital lab, uh, which will uh, share methods for uh, valuing biodiversity and ecosystems, and also support regulatory reform uh, that helps developing member countries shift away from environmentally harmful subsidies. And it will also catalyze sustainable finance through branded financing. So in closing, uh, we look forward to building green, inclusive, and resilient economies across Asia and Pacific, and jointly sharing progress with our peers. Thank you very much. Um, speaking last, one wonders what there is left to say after so many wonderful contributions. Firstly, I would like to say that uh, I want to convey the best regards of our President Jin Lee Chun, uh, who cannot be here, uh, and who's chaired the heads of MDB's meeting uh, this, this year. Um, and I also want to pay tribute to the UK, because I think the UK, by introducing biodiversity on, as a major issue in this COP, has really helped to accelerate the international attention to this uh, issue. I think it used to be said that the debate on biodiversity was lagging behind the debate on climate change by a few years, perhaps this initiative today that you've, that you've led and taken, all the initiatives, will help to, to, to accelerate the development of that agenda much more quickly. And so for AIB's sake, we're very proud to be part of this uh, joint statement and also to recognize the importance of the cooperation among the multilateral development banks as a system that this kind of statement uh, represents. Uh, so very pleased to be, to be, to be part of it. Um, nonetheless, there is a lot of work to do in this um, uh, uh, agenda. Uh, climate biodiversity likes climate in terms of metrics through which to understand the impact of investments, as well as instruments and institutions to govern and finance uh, investment. And so um, one of the things mentioned in the statement is the importance of creating uh, metrics and transparency around measures so we understand uh, the impact uh, that we're making. And in that, we can learn a lot from the way the climate agenda has developed over the last uh, few years. Of course, one of the reasons why this issue is so important on this COP agenda is because we recognize the interrelationships between climate change, biodiversity loss, um, uh, land degradation and desertification, ocean degradation, pollution of air and, and, and water, and of course the One Health agenda also. Um, and the, if these relationships continue to become more stressed, then we will continue to have more experiences like that which we've had over the last two years with the with the, with, the, with the pandemic. So from AIB's point of view, uh, last September we adopted our first uh, corporate strategy, um, which gave us a very strong focus on green infrastructure. We set the target that 50% of our investments will be climate finance by 2025, and along with other MDBs, we're embracing the Paris Alignment Agenda. Therefore, we expect to contribute $50 billion to climate finance by the end of this uh, uh, decade. Biodiversity, conservation, climate mitigation, and adaptation objectives can be achieved simultaneously by financing green infrastructure. For example, mangroves can help to protect coastal populations from sea level rise and typhoons induced by climate change, sequester carbon, and protect biodiversity uh, all at once. From AIB's point of view, we look forward to embracing nature-based solutions to meet the infrastructure challenges that we see uh, in our client countries. Uh, our environmental and social framework, which we uh, adopted uh, a new version of this year, has much strengthened recognition of the importance of conserving uh, and protecting uh, biodiversity. Uh, and biodiversity is one of the critical parameters, therefore, of the due diligence that we do on every single one of the projects that we finance, in common with other uh, 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 MDBs. And so all projects, whether they're focused on biodiversity or not, are screened for their uh, impact in this area. So we're very, very excited to sign the joint statement on nature, people, and planet, which stresses the symbiosis of development of human beings and nature and the important role that MDBs can play in promoting nature-based solutions. And we look forward to co contributing to moving this uh, agenda forward. I'd also want to finish by saying that we should recognize the connection between what's going on here in Glasgow and what will happen in Kunming in China uh, in May of next year with the COP15 on biodiversity. Um, I, the, the, the Kunming Declaration from October highlighted the importance of building an ecological civilization, and I think this joint statement also shows that international financial institutions have a critical role to play in promoting biodiversity and ensuring that as we tackle climate change, we also tackle the issues of biodiversity uh, loss. So I hope that this 
this work that, that the UK has led today will also help to lead to a successful outcome of COP15 also. Thank you very much. The, the discipline from these presidents. You only have to look at that clock. There's one minute left. Uh, uh, so I'm very grateful to you all for, for, for keeping to time and cramming so much uh, positivity um, into what you said. I think this is a massively important thing that you're doing. Um, I think it's hard to exaggerate, in fact, how important it is. I'm so grateful to you for your time today, M even more grateful to you for the work that you're doing. As Danny has just said, there's an enormous amount of work still to be done. We've got to turn that tanker around. But nevertheless, this is a, a really huge step in the right direction. Um, and, and I really hope that, that that is widely recognized. Thank you all so much for your time today. Maurizio, thanks for your leadership. But thank you all for your leadership. And thanks, everyone, for coming.